God does not compel us to go. He does not compel us to go. God does not compel us to go against our will, but he just makes us willing to go. When Jonah Praise the Lord. Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians, where we stopped at chapter 3. I think Dan and Nancy collaborated and got the tape from this morning together so the Indonesians would have copies to take home with them. And uh, I think we got the whole tape on there, didn't we, Dan? The testimonies and then the uproar that hit later. And so... It, uh, how many copies did you run, Nancy? You ran 10. So we got about five copies that will be in the book room if you're interested. <laughs> but it will be available here in the book room if you're interested. Uh, some people had indicated they were interested in it. Mainly I wanted the Indonesians to have some copies to take home with them. Souvenir of your visit with us. They came and upset our services. Now you know that we don't usually have dreadful services like that. It's very quiet and normal and nice. And I think somebody brought uh, somebody with them and they said, now it's very quiet and very normal and there won't be any deliverance except at the end. And so, you know, you could leave just before that comes. And, and then my goodness, we never got around to the end, did we? Or maybe we did. Praise the Lord. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul is wrapping up the 2 Thessalonian letter. Finally, my brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. And I think it's apropos that we have the Indonesians with us. But we pray for them regularly and you pray for them at home. We pray for them here at church. And they're constantly before us as a prayer request. You've met some of them that are vitally involved in this ministry. And now you can pray even better for them. And it was the Lord's doing that brought uh, Klaus uh, Kugler here. And he too is involved in Indonesia. And so it looks like the Lord is moving 
and mar marvelous power. And I, I still think it's a marvelous thing that in a land that's 100% infected with witchcraft and 90% Muslim, that God would put the deliverance flag there instead of some other places he might have done it. I, I find that amazing. I'm still a little annoyed with my church because after all, I wasn't even here when the Leo and Yvonne came through and I can't even say, now look at the great move of God that I started. I wasn't even here. Uh, but it is good, isn't it, that we can look at the great move of God that he started and he continues to sustain. I thank God that when I'm gone from this place, when I'm out and I'm out on business for the Lord, very seldom I'm gone on Sunday, but once in a while, and they came through, and I think the Lord had a definite purpose in that so that uh, Leo and Yvonne could look back to a church, not just a pastor, but a church full of ordinary people who had had, a, had an extraordinary God and had learned some things, and they shared, and uh, I just praise God. This shows you what God can do, and uh, this is an encouragement to anybody who will listen to what God is saying. And these days, he keeps telling me over and over again since this deliverance work began, despise not the day of small things. See, that's what's happened in our day. If you don't have a multi-million dollar television program, if you don't have a 20-story office building, if you don't have an airplane, if you don't have this, you don't have that, you certainly couldn't do much for the Lord. And I'll tell you what, if you go back to the early church, they had none of those things, and yet they turned the world upside down. And they had none of our modern conveniences whatsoever, and yet God used them to change the world. I'm convinced God hasn't changed any. I'm convinced his message is just like it was. I think he's still in business just like he used to be. Our business is to find out where he's working and how he's working and get in his train. We're not to change him. We're not to try to manipulate God and write out programs and say, here, Lord, this is the way we want you to do it. We're rather to study his word and find out what he is doing, how he wants it done, and then to fit into the place where we're supposed to be. He doesn't even need us to grab the reins and say, come on, Lord, I'll take it over now. You're dragging your feet a little bit. I'll get her going. He doesn't need any of that. He just needs men and women who will say, here, my Lord, use me however you want me to be. We've had too many of these that run and grab the leadership, and all they have is a flappy mouth. They have a tongue that's hinged in the middle and flaps at both ends. And you soon run out of hot air, and the first thing you know, you're, you're sunk. We need men and women who are saturated with the Word of God and move slowly but deliberately and surely because God is leading them step by step. And we thank God for our friends in Indonesia. They're going through the same sort of shakings that we go through here. We thank God for the deliverance works across the land. They're small, and the Lord keeps them small. He shakes the tree every once in a while, and any loose fruit will go flying. But there's a few of you have weathered a few storms, right? You're still hanging around here, all right? And uh, some of you got a few bruises on you here and there. But that's all right. If they're battle scars, it doesn't really matter that much, does it? But the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And it's not how big things are as far as the world sees. It's what Jesus sees and what he wants. And our tiny church is a rebuke to the unbelieving body of Christ today who thinks you have to have all the trappings and all the circus performers and everything else. All you need is the word of God and dedicated men and women to fall in love with Jesus and to begin to love one another and to begin to do the works of Jesus. And then it spreads and it just keeps spreading. And thank God for this. Amen. I'm glad to be in the middle of something God's doing, aren't you? Now Paul writes to these people and says they are praying he wants them to pray that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you he says you and Thessalonica are having a great open doors coming we pray we want you to pray for us to have the same thing that the Lord, word of the Lord have free course the word of God is invincible there are no walls it cannot scale 
It's only that we have to find out what God's time is and what his hour is and what his appointment time is. And then the word of God will go right through and do the work. And we praise God for this. And it says that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. You haven't run across any of those, have you? Where you work or maybe where you live and the house you live in, you might run across some of those. Um, no hands, please. Uh, that we might be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Or had you noticed? Have you noticed that some of your believing friends do not have faith to believe in deliverance? They oppose it. They think you're a crackpot. No, they don't think so. They know so. And uh, we need to pray for Brother Paul Patterson, Dr. Paul Patterson up in Minneapolis, who's under attack by the state of Minnesota because he recognized in some of his patients a need for deliverance and he advised them to come here, he even offered to bring them here for prayer because he said the things that are wrong with you are more than I can fix with a knife. And for that, there are people trying to get his license pulled. Let's pray the Lord will block that and have it backfire on those wicked ones and have that wicked law exposed for what it is. See, the, the enemy has slipped in while we've slept. And while we've shouted hallelujah and jumped the pews and swung on the chandeliers, the enemy's gone in and changed the laws and made it against the law to pray. Do you know how many restrictions they've put on prayer across the land already? And do you realize what they're trying to do? The enemy is busy. And the church sleeps on and wants to put on a circus. We don't need a circus. We need a full, all-out war effort. You say, well, what should we do? Get some guns and shoot them? No. The devil will raise them up faster and you can shoot them down, for one thing. There's a better way. Learn how to attack in the heavenlies where they're getting their power, their direction, and their intelligence. And bind it up there and start from there and choke it down. Does that sound like, now that's something you can do, isn't it? And you won't have to do anything except get your warfare prayers as a starter. They'll get you started. They're not, uh, you know, I mean, they're not sacred in the sense you have to repeat them word for word, but they'll give you some ideas of how to attack in the heavenlies. Once you start attacking in the heavenlies, you're going to start getting results. You'll know you're getting results because all of a sudden things will be knocking at your door. Some of them may knock your door down to try to get at you. They'll be so angry and so infuriated that you have the audacity to think that believers ought to be in this war. But you're just going about your business. You're to do the works of Jesus. And he said he came to, ma to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus was manifested, the scripture says, to destroy the works of the devil. And you don't do that by physical means. You do it with spiritual power. And the church is almost powerless today, but that doesn't mean she has to stay that way. We've learned a little bit, and we have a great deal more to learn, but the little we've learned has made it possible for us to cause the enemies of dark, in, the, of, in the darkness to quake in their boots. I had a, a demon of principality some years ago tell me, and this was before we had some other breakthroughs we've had since that time, and he said, when were he said, you are a crazy idiot. He said, I cannot believe that one man can cause this much trouble. He said, we bought the others. Why won't you sell out? And I told him, you can't even sell a junk car without an, a title. And I gave my title to Jesus a long time ago. He bought me and he paid for me and I gave him the title. I hadn't even got the title. I couldn't sell out if I wanted to. You can't either. You say, what did he say? Well, he got very angry. He called me a lot of names. My mother never did. He was very upset about it. I told him, I said, if you want me, you'll have to go deal with Jesus. He holds the title. He bought me out of the, the market of sin when I was 17 years old, sliding to hell from a church pew. And I was just, uh, and you know, you, you say, are you sure that you're saved? Oh, yes. That song, oh yes, oh yes, I'm, I'm a child of the king, his royal blood now flows. You say, how sure are you that you're born again? I'm so sure that I could swing out over hell on a rotten corn stalk and sing amazing grace and never be frightened. <laughs> How's that? That's how sure the grace that you... Now you take a look at me. Would you like to swing on a rotten corn stalk with me? Huh? <laughs> 
See, you're filled with unbelief. You don't think that corn stalk would hold. <laughs> but that's how sure I am that the grace of God is sufficient. And you've got to get your roots deep down into the grace of God. That's what holds you. That's what comforts. That's what establishes. That's what holds. And that's what keeps you going when everything else goes. You still are hanging in there. And when you say, I want to give up, and deep down on your side there's an echo say, but you can't. The grace of God continues on. I had a teacher years ago who used to say, we're going to talk about the astounding, abounding, amazing grace of God. And he said, man, if you really believe in the grace of God, if you teach the grace of God, the world will hate you. Even most of the church will hate you because the doctrine of grace that's in the scriptures alone is hated by the world. It's hated by worldly people, and it's hated by those who have never perceived the absolute grace of God. Most people believe in being saved by grace and kept by works. But God means saved by grace, kept by grace, and your works come up for review at the judgment seat concerning rewards and not concerning salvation. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen? Well, praise the Lord. Every time I look on this page, I, my eyes keep jumping back to this top. I might as well read this verse up here. And just keep my eyes are just drawn right to it like a magnet. It said, And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now I feel better. All right. That wicked one shall be destroyed. Our enemy will be overcome. Maybe not in our lifetimes. We may have to stand as Stephen did and as the stones fall around us and crush out our life, we may have to look up and see Jesus and say, I'm coming home. But that's not going to change the outcome. I read the last chapter in the book. In the last chapter of the book, everything's fine. Everything's fine. The enemy is going to the lake of fire. The devil and his angels are put away forever. And God's saints are singing the song of Moses and the Lamb around the, the judgment seat. And the angels are standing in awe and wonder because they've never been saved. And they don't understand this marvelous song that the saints are singing. That's where we're heading, people. We're sojourners now. We're just passing through. You're not going to last over 80, 90 years. Look at yourself in the mirror now. You sure you want to last 90 years? My, my, my. You might not have to squint your eyes to see yourself. And when you do, you say, ah, what's that? Don't be clinging on to this life. This life is to be spent for Jesus. Pour it out. The only way this life will count is if you pour it out for Jesus and pour it into some other people. Oh me, here we go again, the weeping prophet. Uh, people, if you could just let God open your eyes to what you can do. Young people, if you could just open your eyes I was as young as some of you one time. I know I don't look it, but I was many long years ago. And some godly people challenged me, said, give your life to Jesus. He can do more with it than you can. And you know, they were right. And I've stumbled and slid and sideways and backwards and forwards and every which way it seemed like, but I've kept going. And I can look back now on so many years with the Lord and I can tell you it's true the only thing that really matters is what you're going to do for Jesus the only things that's going to last for eternity are going to be what you've done for Jesus the things you've poured out for his love a lot of these other things are going by the wayside people you don't seem to realize this earth is destined to be burned with fire everything here is going up in smoke one day and there'll be nothing left of it except in the annals of God to say there was once a place like that and the only thing's going to be left is what you do for Jesus how foolish we are to be caught up in the cares of this life and not pour out our lives for Jesus and not give ourselves that the word might go forth and people might be helped. I feel very close to my church, and I tell people that everywhere. I told the Indonesians this, didn't I, when I first came? Because there are people in this fellowship who stand with me in prayer. They, they're weak, they wobble, 
uh, they, they wiggle all over the place. I think they're imitating the preacher is what they're doing. And, uh, but by and far, there are many people who do pray and they do hold me up in prayer. And when I make these trips, it's by the grace of God that I go through. And a lot of times when I can't sleep at night and I'm rolling and tossing, many times thousands of miles from home, I remember that some of my flock are praying for me. And I can feel the touch of prayer. And you see, if you're going to invest that much prayer in me, I'm going to have to go there and break the devil's neck. So it'll be worth the trip, right? And better still, show other people how to do it. It's more important to sow the good seed. And because you've gone with me in prayer, you've had a part in all of this. Now, these Indonesians you see face to face, some of them you'll never see till you get to heaven. Some of those you prayed for. And that the time went through and people that were saved, that were blessed, that were delivered. And then those who were helped by those who did get delivered. You see, we don't even know. It's like a, throwing a pebble out in the middle of a lake and the ripples start going. And the ripples just go in every direction. And they just keep going on and on and on and on. And when you throw your prayers out in something that's worthwhile, you never waste it. It's never wasted. It starts something in motion. And when you get to heavens, when you're going to find out, there are going to be some little Indonesians come running up to you when you get to heaven and say, I want to hug your neck. And you say, well, sure, but I don't believe I know you. Oh, no, you never met me. But I asked Jesus, whose prayer, whose money, and whose prayer support helped Pastor Worley to come, and Brother Rob and the others to come and give the deliverance message? I never even saw him, but people who were touched by what happened reached out to me, and I was blessed. And then they got books translated and pamphlets that helped me and I reached out and my family got saved. I think about the witch doctor's son and his whole family getting saved. The witch doctor and all of them being saved. They were not saved when he was born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit. But when he got deliverance, then he went home and he was different. And they knew it. He was different before. But they, they were not impressed enough to let go of their witchcraft. But they did. And I'm convinced there are many others. And you had a part in that. And the Lord's going to tell everybody who had a part in it. Amen? And I'll tell you something else. This prayer business is a two-way street. We have Indonesians who pray for Hegbish and pray for me every day as well. You don't, you know, you don't just invest it and it's all give. They're returning because they love the Lord and they love the help they've gotten and they appreciate it. They turn their prayers toward Hegbish and toward here. And if you talk to the Indonesians, some of them, the desire of their heart is to come and sit in this place just to visit here. And believe that, it's thousands of miles away. And there are some people who would give anything just to come and be in Hegwish for a Sunday. And yet we have people within driving distance here who can take it or leave it. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I'll be there. Maybe I won't. Depends on how I feel about it. Aren't you ashamed? And yet there are people over there who would give anything to come and be here just for a day. Be in this church they've heard about. They've read about. I tell you people, we better wake up. Get our priorities straight. There are some things that are important and some that are side issues. I know you've got to work. I know you've got certain responsibilities you've got to take care of. But your priorities, number one, should be to be where Jesus wants you to be, be the kind of man or woman he wants you to be. And you can be that while you work. You can be that where you are. You can be that at home if that's where God puts you. But it's important to be what God wants you to be because there's going to come a great sharing in the heavenly someday. All the blessings, 
all the wonderful things, the wonder works that the Holy Spirit has done through his word, all the gracious things that he's done with our little investment are going to come back and we're going to be shocked. And we're going to be ashamed too because we didn't put out more. We were so afraid we'd get ahead of the Lord, you know, and we'd outdo and the Lord might not match it. Oh, people, you can never lose when you're pouring out your life for the Lord. I'm convinced of that. And Paul is praying for these people and urging them to pray for them over there. It's a two-way street, this prayer business. And everywhere we go and there's a successful deliverance meeting, we always have some people who then begin to point their prayers back here to help you and to help me. So we have friends we don't even know about. But they love us because of the ministry and because of what it's done for them and their families. Thank God. You never know when the seed is sown just what results are going to be, do you? But the Lord is faithful and will establish you and keep you from evil. He wants them to be kept from evil. We have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the things that we command you. He said, I just believe you're going to hang in there and do the right things. All the things we've encouraged you to do, I believe you'll do over at Thessalonica. Now, and the Lord directs your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. You've been waiting for him? Are you sure? Patiently? Ooh, there's that dreadful word again. Do you know anybody that has enough patience? You know some that have more patience than others, but I don't think anybody has enough, do they? I'm not even going to talk about that because it puts us all under conviction. I want to preach on something nice and pleasant, make you feel good. But I'll assign you the job of reading the first two chapters of James, and that'll take care of patience for you. You'll find out how God makes it and all about it over there. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition you received of us. Ooh, that's not very loving. He said, withdraw yourself from disorderly people. If they walk away from the truth, you walk away from them. Well, I'm afraid it hurt their feelings. Well, it hurts God's feelings for you to disobey him. Why does he tell us to do that? Because if you keep on hobnobbing with them, some of their evil is going to rub off on you. You don't have to treat them badly. But you've seen Christians, haven't you, who just insisted on being buddy-buddy with an old rotten egg. Well, I'm trying to get him to church. He promised me if I'd go hunting with him on Sunday morning, he'd come church with me on Sunday night. I've never known when I'm to show up yet. They're lying. If they're lost, their father's the devil, and he's the father of liars. He didn't mind lying at all. And you're a sucker if you try to go any way but God's way to get them. If you walk away from church on Sunday morning, you're telling him church is not really that important. Going hunting with you is more. You're welcome. Be careful what you tell your relatives and friends when they come to visit you. If you stay out of church, you're telling them church doesn't really mean that much. But I don't get to see them that often. Tell them to come sometime besides Sunday. They'll get the message or just say, uh, we'll be gone for a couple, three hours, and we'll be back. You can come with us if you like. If you don't, well, just make yourself at home. We'll be back. They'll time their, you know, I've known people who had, come, who had relatives who would come in about 30 minutes before time to leave for church for a visit. And rather than hurt their feelings, they'd say, oh, well, I guess we better stay home. We plan to go today, but we better not. No, if you walk out on them once, they'll either change their, they'll get happy staying there waiting on you, or they'll change their visiting time. You've got to fix out what's wrong because you see you're telling people what's important. And the neighbors that know you come to church when your car is parked at home and there's nothing but a big party going on in your backyard, then they notice that. Aha. Uh -huh. I see it doesn't really mean that much. There's ho hollering about, oh, you got to go to church with me. And I see it, it doesn't take much to set them aside. They just go somewhere else. It, it, well, it doesn't matter. Be careful. You are advertising with a megaphone. I don't care about church. What we're doing is more important. 
You're welcome. You can say amen or oh me, whichever fits. We've got to tighten up people. Paul is calling for a separation. He says when somebody is disorderly and don't, doesn't walk after the traditions received of, God, of Paul, he said separate yourself from them because he knows that Christian will become affected and become as carnal as a billy goat hanging around them. For yourselves know how that you ought to follow us. For we behaved our, not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be charged with any of you. Remember, Paul stayed at this place six weeks and he worked making tents during the day and preached at night and built a powerful, thriving little church. Now, he was some kind of a dynamo. He said, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example to you that follow us. He said, we could say, hey, come on, pitch in here. We're doing all this work. Uh, you, can, you can pitch in and support us. But he deliberately chose not to do it in Thessalonians. They probably had some American evangelists go ahead of them who'd fleece the people so that everybody said, well, every preacher comes through. That's all they do is take offerings. Paul said, this is one bunch and won't do that. And he determined they wouldn't be chargeable at all, even though they had a right for the people to help them. They chose not to deliberately, just simply because of the four flushers and the phonies and the fakes that had gone through. And those boys are still trotting around the country picking up the money. Don't kid yourself. Just because the PTL manure pile is, is still stinking, don't think there's not a lot of others around. Everything that claps its hands and clicks its heels together and hollers hallelujah is not from God. Matter of fact, a whole lot of it is from the other side of the fence. It's time that believers got their eyes open, began to discern which is which, and withdraw from those disorderly people. I've told you people again and again, one way you can spot the fellow that's not in order with God is when he comes out moochie, moochie, moochie. When he comes with his hand out saying, how much is in it for me? You better drop him and run for the nearest exit because you got the wrong kind of turkey in the, in the oven. All he needs to do is be basted. Well done. And I'll tell you one thing, those kind too, if you cut the money off, they'll be gone. They're in it for the money. That's exactly what they're there for. They're not there. They lie. It's like I told you when I came back from Indonesia, I was up in Surabaya and Marcerello had been there and they said, oh, he stayed in the finest hotel there and he had to have a big suite and he had to have special food brought in and he couldn't see anybody all day long because he was, he was closeted with the Lord trying to uh, find out what the Lord was saying so he could tell the Indonesians. I said, he lies. Because if he had been closeted with the Lord, the Lord would say, you quit lying to the Indonesians and you quit taking their money. That man stripped them of thousands of dollars and it's a sham. It's a scam when you go in and you, you give people, you offer them a bottle of water and say, this will cure you from everything. But you have to pay $10 up front. Then they take off out of town and they're long gone before you swig down the bottle and find out there's nothing to it but water. And that's exactly what these religious jerks are doing. They're offering the people everything and giving them nothing in return. Well, pray for the day that God will open the eyes of the people who are being fleeced by this kind of thing. He said, even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Now, if you want to eliminate unemployment, here it is. You can wipe out unemployment in a hurry. Any able-bodied person, if he doesn't work, he doesn't eat. He lasts about 40 days. Then you can have a funeral, and that'll be the end of that. Won't have a problem with his unemployment anymore. He'd be gone. There's another place. Uh, Paul is very explicit about this. He said, if he won't work, he shouldn't eat. We had a case of that. I've mentioned it to you before. We had some uh, people come in here, or in the early days especially. Young people came out of the hippie movement. Now, I look like I'm in the hippie movement. I'm built that way, but I didn't plan it that way. But uh, you know what I'm talking about, the hippie movement. And they came in with a hippie philosophy, you know, that I'm supposed to go out and hand out tracts now that I'm saved, and everybody else is supposed to work, go to work at 8 o'clock and get off at 5, and they bring in the money and furnish the house and food and everything else. And this boy was able to get make it to every meal. 
He was able-bodied enough to make it to every meal at the house he was staying at. And then uh, he would go out at night and he'd hand out tracks to we in the wee hours of the morning. Then he'd come in, he'd sleep in. He managed to get up for breakfast. And then he'd go back and sleep some more and then he, he managed to get up for lunch. And then he'd sleep some more and he'd get up, he'd manage to get up for every meal. And he had just strength enough to lift his fork to his mouth. And, uh, but he, uh, he went through several houses like that. Some gullible gooses, you know, were trying to help him. Took him in. And then they'd burn out and they'd dump him out. And after a while, they'd dump him out. About three months is all they could stand him. And um, so he ended up over at our place, our church. And uh, he'd been dumped again. He had an old car. And so he's sleeping in his car and it was getting cold. And it gets cold up here. And um, he was sleeping in his car. Somebody brought him to my house one night. I said, Bob, do any place to stay? And... I said, well, I've got two daughters, and I don't want him in the house with my daughters. I'll just tell you frankly. I don't trust him. More, I throw, as far as I could throw a piano. And I don't feel particularly strong. But uh, I said, I'll tell you what. I'll take him tonight. We'll put him in a bunk down in the basement. And I brought him in, and I said, Bob, I said, uh, where are you working? Oh, I'm not working. The Lord told me not to work. I said, he did. He said, yes. I told him, I said, well, you can stay here tonight. One night, that's it. In the morning, you're gone. And this is your one night, and that'll be your last, your first and your last. But I said, uh, and then I said, uh, where are you working? Oh, I'm not working because the Lord told me not to work. I said, he did? Oh, yes. He said, I'm supposed to go out every night and hand out tracts and witness. That's what God, that's my ministry. That's what God wants me to do. And I said, you're really convinced? And, oh, yes, yes. It would be sinful for me to go to work. Here he is, a big old 22-year-old boy, healthy as a horse. As I said, able to get to every, the table for every meal. And, uh, but he couldn't work. And I said, well, you know, Bob, I think that's just wonderful. I have seldom run across such dedication. And I said, in about 40 days... Uh, when I preach your funeral, I'm going to tell the people how dedicated you were. He said, what? I said, when I preach your funeral. He said, what do you mean funeral? I said, well, over in Thessalon Second Thessalonians, Paul said that the man who is able to and, can't and won't do it, won't work, shouldn't eat. So I'm going to pass the word around to nobody's to feed you. Because you're dedicated to do what God says. And, of course, we wouldn't want to disobey God's word. And since you're dedicated to this, I know you won't mind and you can last about 40 days and then you'll die and I'll, you know, I'll be glad to tell everybody at your funeral what a great hero of the faith this man is. He was willing even to die to stay by what he believed. He went out the next day and got a job. Lazy hound. Now, the reason he said this, he said, We hear there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. The people who cause a lot of the trouble are busybodies, and the reason they're busybodies is because they don't have enough of their business to tend to, so they tend to everybody else's. And over in Proverbs it says, Where there's no tail bearer, the strife ceases. So the order of the day is, Shut up. No, don't tell your best friend and tell them not to tell it. Just shut up. Let it die with you. If you do that, you'll find out it'll hush. Now, I can get more specific, but of course, I want to keep the message sweet. Now, we've got to head this thing off at the past. The devil, that's how he divides people. He gets among them. Did you know that she said so and so? Did you know that he said? Did you have you heard? <gasps> Isn't it awful? <laughs> I used to have a list called the Dirty Dozen. Isn't it awful? Have you heard? Oh my goodness. Now don't tell us all. But I want you to pray about this. Well, that's a good sacred reason to drop gossip, isn't it? Get on the phone for a half an hour, you call everybody you can think of. 
Say, now don't tell anybody but your best friends, and if you do tell them, tell them be sure not to tell anybody else. <laughs> and so it just goes like wildfire. And you know what happens when things are told? They always come out different. When I was a kid growing up, we used to uh, have parties every once in a while, and we had a game we played. We were all set in a circle, and it was called gossip. And so one person would start a sentence, just a short sentence about something, and he'd whisper it to the person next to them, and then they'd turn around, and they'd whisper it in the ear of the next one. It'd go all around the circle, about 20, 25 people. You would not believe what came out on the other end. Not a single word that started ended up. The way, and the, that's the best illustration I know of what happens when it's told. Because, I mean, you don't want to tell it just plain like it was. You embroider it a little bit, you know. And then the next person said, well, my, it'd be better if I had a few more ruffles on it. And they put a few more on it. And the first thing you know, it's, it's an avalanche. And you've got a disaster going. The best thing to do is shut up. As we've told you so many times, a lot of times when you see something or hear something, be sure to take it to the Lord first. And there are times you need to go to leaders and tell them things. I'm not trying to tell you don't ever come and tell me something because there are times when you come and tell me something, I'll put a stop to it. I can get downright nasty if I think the flock's in danger. But I don't do that unless the flock's in danger. But my job is to watch out for things that'll hurt the flock. And don't hesitate to come and tell me something because if you tell me something and say, now don't tell anybody, I won't. And there are a lot of things people don't tell me, don't tell anybody, and I don't anyway because it's not... There's no need. And a lot of times, you know, you'll have your friends come to you and they'll, boom, you know. And then you think you have to take it and tell somebody else. A lot of times they just need to blow off steam, let it die. Sometimes when they get through talking about it, they're through with it. Well, now men are more like that than women. Women like to keep picking. Picky, picky, pooky, gals. I'm sorry, but you picky, 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 just pick the rambles. Men will square off and, and punch each other in the nose, and then in a day or two, they'll be friends again. Ladies will still be stewing three months later. <laughs> Did she ever apologize? No, she didn't. <laughs> well, she said she did, but I don't believe her. And I'm not accepting. I'm not going to get taken in. And the first thing you know, you divide up in sides, you know, and are you on her side or my side? Are you on his side or my side? <laughs> Let's be on the Lord's side and join together and hit the enemy with everything we've got. Amen? Now, all of us can be drawn aside by these little foolish things, and they, I'm deliberately overdrawing them to make them sound as stupid as I can so you won't want to be stupid, see? I'm manipulating you, see? I'm making it appear so ridiculous, you'll think, ooh, I don't ever want to do that, see? Well, if you don't ever do it again, that'll, I'll have accomplished what I hope. Now, but seriously, folks, watch out for the enemy trying to divide and conquer. That's what he always wants to do. Now, them that are such, these busybodies, we commend and exhort you by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. He said, tell those people to settle down and work and eat their own food and hush. Be quiet. There's a scripture, study to be quiet. That's a good one too. But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Now, sometimes you think, oh, I'll tell you. I'm just so sick and tired of this. I, I pray for her, and then she goes out and gets tangled up all over again. I pray for him. Look what he did. He said, don't be weary in well-doing. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Pull back from him. Give him the royal chill. If he doesn't want to walk with Jesus, you don't have to be ugly to him. Just have nothing to say. I had a person that used to bug me, and he kept on doing this over the phone. And so finally when he called me, 
and I picked up the phone and he told me who it was. He'd say, hello man, this is so-and-so. I said, oh, with all the enthusiasm I could muster. And he said, blah, 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 blah. How, how are things at Hagwish? Fine. How's the weather? Fine. Snow was three foot deep. Um, I wasn't going to engage him in conversation. I didn't want to talk to him. Uh, well, we're doing fine here. I didn't comment. I wasn't interested. I didn't want him to think I was interested because then he'd go into a long discourse describing it, you see. And finally, I had to cut him off and say, I have, have some people here. I'm busy. I have to go. Click. And some people, you can just chill them. Now, this fellow happens to be an idiot. You can't chill him. He keeps trying. I haven't heard from him in a long time. I'm going to give him Joe's phone number. Let him call Joe. You know who I'm talking about, Joe? Yes, Joe knows who it is. <laughs> or give him Jerry's number. Let him talk to Jerry. You know, Jerry. <laughs> well, he needs to find somebody that likes to talk, you know. He's a real pistol. If you don't have anybody to talk to, you let me know, and I'll send you his phone number, your phone number to him. I guarantee you he'll call you. He'll walk the living daylights out of you from morning till night. Well, he said, withdraw from him. Not, count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. I've tried that, and that didn't work on him either. I've written him. I've talked to him personally. I've talked to him on the phone. Nothing stops him, so I just... I'm in the deep freeze every time he calls. As far as he's concerned, I went to Russia on an extended missionary trip. <coughs> we'll be back for, for another year. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is token in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. So be it. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart or you're not sure you have, wouldn't you like to tonight? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done this or you're not sure you have, wouldn't you like to tonight? If you can't get it settled where you are so you know for sure who you are and where you're going, you can come forward. There'll be people here at the front and somebody will be glad to pray with you, open the Bible and see where you are and check it against the Bible. If you get on the Bible, you'll be all right. You're on the Bible foundation. Don't go away fearful, uncertain. You can know that you're born again. If that's not your problem, but you're driven, harassed, tormented, this is producing compulsive behavior, which is slowing down, stopping, and reversing spiritual growth and progress. This is the work of demons, and they have to be cast out. This sign shall follow them that believe in my name, shall they cast out devils, speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. We believe in the whole thing evangelism, deliverance, and healing. And if you need help tonight, we urge you to come forward and just make it known that you need help. We have many workers here who will be glad to help you and use what they know to help you get free. Let's stand saying something about that name. And if you need help, don't hesitate to come. Jesus, Jesus, there's just something if you happen to be a first-timer coming for prayer, it's your first time coming for prayer, you can cut the line, come straight down the center. If you're a first-timer coming for prayer, cut the line, just come right straight down the center. You'll get the first of the workers.